I'm going to do my best to go through the pathophysiology, exactly uh, how Parkinson's is affected and why dopamine um, and dopaminergic pathways can affect uh, and improve Parkinsonism. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to draw a coronal section through the brain. So if this is uh, my head right here, and I've got my nose, mouth, neck. If I cut right through here, and uh, I make a section of the brain so that we are looking at the brain like this from the front. So we're looking this way towards this section that I cut. So the first thing I'm going to point out is we're, we're cutting it right at the level of the motor cortex. So here's our motor cortex. And then we're going to have a thalamus. Right next to the thalamus we're going to have a caudate nucleus. And we're also going to have a triangular area that is really three different things. We have on the outside the putamen. We have the, then these two are both called globus pallidus but this is the globus pallidus externa and this is the globus pallidus interna. Sometimes this is called the globus pallidus, la the lateral globus pallidus because it's lateral and sometimes it's called the medial globus pallidus because it's medial but I'm going to call this externa and interna. Then we also have our subthalamic nucleus. It's called subthalamic nucleus because it's below the thalamus and then down a little bit lower we have the substantia nigra and so the substantia nigra is really broken into two parts. You have the top part, which is the substantia nigra pars compacta, and then the bottom part is the substantia nigra pars reticulata. So let me go ahead and label these things. This is the caudate nucleus. The reason it's called the caudate nucleus, um, whenever you look at it from front to back, so if this is the front of my brain and this is the back of my brain, it actually makes a shape kind of like a tail, and so it it gets skinny as it goes around. It's like if you were to flip this upside down it would look like a, a dog waving his tail in the air. So caudate means towards the tail or tail like. So this is a caudate nucleus. Then this is the putamen. This is the globus pallidus. And th we have the, in the external and the internal globus pallidus. Then this is the subthalamic nucleus. And finally, the substantia, niag substantia niag nigra. And remember, the top is the pars compacta. The bottom is the pars reticulata. And the reason I make a, a distinction here is because the substantia nigra pars reticulata and the globus pallidus interna are basically going to behave the same way and, it, as, and, and often they're grouped together, um, whereas the substantia nigra pars compacta has its own special role. So the first thing I'm going to do is map out this uh, the sequence of events here and then I'm going to try to make it into sort of a cartoon so you can understand it a little bit better. So what happens is Whenever you're ready to make a movement, your motor cortex, which is right here, it sends a message down to the putamen, an excitatory message, and he says, hey putamen, I want to move. And so what the putamen does then, is he sends an inhibitory message to the globus pallidus interna. This turns off the globus pallidus interna. The globus pallidus interna will typically send an inhibitory message to the thalamus. But with it turned off, it's no longer sending this inhibitory message. The thalamus is always standing by trying to send a signal to the cerebral cortex saying, yeah, go ahead and move. The cerebral cortex, the motor cortex, is sitting around saying, I'll move as long as the thalamus says I can. And so when the thalamus sends this excitatory message to the cortex and says, yeah, go ahead and move, then you get your motor cortex disinhibited and it sends a message down to the body that says go ahead and move. As long as you're not getting a message from the cerebral cortex to the, uh, the putamen, this means that basically you haven't decided to do anything. So you're not sending this message, that means the putamen is not turning off globus pallidus interna. And so globus pallidus interna says to the thalamus constantly, do not allow the cortex to move. 
do not allow the cortex to move. And whenever the, it's sending that message, it turns off the, the thalamus' uh, message back to the motor cortex that says, yeah, go ahead and move. But whenever the cortex sends a message down to the putamen, it tells the putamen, go ahead and inhibit globus pallidus interna, and then it turns off the globus pallidus interna, turning this signal off, allowing the thalamus to go ahead and send its signal, allowing the motor cortex to move. Once the cortex gets that message, it sends a message down to your arms, hands, feet, legs, whatever, and says, go ahead and do this action. This is called the direct pathway. So this is the direct pathway. You might think of the cerebral cortex as a kid sitting on a swing. He's just sitting there. He doesn't know how to pump yet. He's waiting for somebody to push him. And then you have the thalamus, who is a nice kid who says, okay, cerebral cortex, I'll push you. So this is the cerebral motor cortex. And this is the thalamus. Thalamus is always standing by to push. But you also have the big bully. The big bully is always standing by with his fist out in the air saying, Thalamus, if you move the cerebral cortex, I'll punch you. And this big bully is the globus pallidus interna. As long as cerebral cortex is just happy here sitting on the swing not being pushed, he won't yell. But once in a while he's going to yell and he's going to holler at the teacher. And so here we have the teacher. The playground rules are going to be enforced. The teacher comes and says, Globus pallidus, you're coming with me. Globus pallidus interna, you're coming with me. I'm turning you off. As soon as he gets turned off, that allows thalamus to push the cerebral cortex. So this is the putamen. And this is our call for help. Coming from the cerebral cortex. So you can think of the call for help as an excitatory, an excitatory message. You can think of putamen as being an inhibitory message. Inhibits the uh, globus pallidus interna. And the globus pallidus, if he wasn't being inhibited, he would be inhibiting the, the thalamus. So this is also inhibitory. But on the other hand, Whenever the thalamus is uh, responding to the cerebral cortex, this is excitatory. I'm sorry, I just changed up. I should have kept everything in the blue typically being inhibitory and red typically being excitatory. But just keep in mind that this is excitatory, inhibitory, inhibitory, and excitatory. So again, one final look. Motor cortex is calling for help. Teacher, the putamen comes and notices that the globus pallidus interna is being a bully and trying to fight the thalamus, keeping him from pushing motor cortex. So putamen sends an inhibitory signal to the globus pallidus interna. Globus pallidus interna was sending an inhibitory message to the thalamus, but it gets turned off because teacher knocks him out. This allows thalamus to send an excitatory message, allowing the motor cortex to move. Now I want to point out really quick before I move on to the indirect pathway that I didn't mention the caudate nucleus because the caudate nucleus and the putamen are essentially connected by cell bridges and they are essentially the same structure in this pathway. So caudate nucleus and putamen would react in the same way. This is like the teacher's body and this is the teacher's head. So one thing you can do that's helpful is you can look at the number of inhibitory signals. There's one inhibitory signal here and one inhibitory signal here. And you can look and you can multiply these out as negative numbers. Every inhibitory signal is a negative number. So negative 1 times negative 1 is equal to positive 1. So that would be an excitatory response to the motor cortex. Now there's another pathway called the indirect pathway. And the way that that pathway works is whenever the motor cortex uh, signals excitatory signaling to the putamen, instead of the putamen going straight to the globus pallidus interna, it signals to the globus pallidus externa.
So there's an inhibitory signal sent to the globus pallidus externa. Globus pallidus externa is typically sending an inhibitory signal to the subthalamic nucleus, but that signal gets turned off by the putamen. So you can see putamen's turning off GPE, which is typically sending a signal to the subthalamic nucleus. The subthalamic nucleus, whenever it's not being inhibited, sends a, an uh, excitatory signal to the globus pallidus interna, and the, that bully, when he gets excited, he goes up and beats up the thalamus and prevents him from sending his message to the motor cortex. And this is known as the indirect pathway. So what actually happens in the indirect pathway, if we always have, it's subthalamic nucleus is basically always sending uh, an excitatory signal to globus pallidus interna, and it increases his inhibitory signal to the thalamus, so you're not getting any message to the motor cortex. GPE is typically turning off the subthalamic nucleus, saying, yeah, I'm not going to let that happen. But the putamen, in this case, comes and stops the GPE from doing that. When the GPE isn't turning off subthalamic nucleus, you get the inhibition of the thalamus and stopping of the motor cortex. If we do the same thing here as we did last time by multiplying negative ones for every uh, inhibitory signal, we get negative one times negative one times negative one. That's three negatives. So what happens is you get negative one times negative one times negative 1, this equals negative 1. So you get an inhibitory signal if it's a negative number. And thus the motor cortex can't fire a signal down to the body to say move. So just like last time, we have the motor cortex wanting to move on a swing and thalamus is always standing by ready to push him. Here again we have the globus pallidus interna saying, thalamus I will punch you with my big fist if you move this, this motor cortex. But in this case we have another player and this is the subthalamic nucleus. Subthalamic nucleus is like the bully's uh, sounding board. He says, yeah, go, sub, go uh, GPI. GPI, kick his butt. And this is the subthalamic nucleus. Now, you may remember that globus pallidus interna has a twin brother named globus pallidus externa. And the twin brother's job is to threaten subthalamic nucleus. He's like, my brother is a jerk, and you don't need to be responding to him, or I'll kick your butt. And in this case, anytime motor cortex yells for help, he's yelling for help to the teacher, which is Putamen. We call him Mr. Putamen. When Mr. Putamen hears, he gets a little bit confused. He didn't see what was happening. So he comes over here, and he thinks that the bad globus pallidus was the globus pallidus externa. So he comes over here and he says, you're going to stop that right now. So this is Mr. Putamen. And he is stopping globus pallidus externa, the twin brother. The twin brother would typically like to stop subthalamic nucleus from being the, uh, the bully sounding board. But he can't because he's being stopped by the teacher. So the, the, the sounding board yells up to the bully, yeah, go get him, beat up the thalamus. And globus pallidus externa stops the thalamus from, I'm sorry, that should be blue, stops the thalamus from pushing motor cortex. So no matter how much the motor cortex yells for help, the teacher gets it wrong in this indirect pathway. So now we have these two pathways, the indirect pathway and the direct pathway. Now remember the direct pathway, putamen, uh, here's the motor cortex yell for help, and I'll make that more clear. And when he hears the motor cortex yell for help, he goes and stops the bully globus pallidus interna, which allows thalamus to push the motor cortex. And the indirect pathway, he hears uh, the motor cortex yell for help, but instead of stopping the bully, he stops the bully's good brother. The bully's good brother was about to beat up subthalamic nucleus, but he can't anymore. So subthalamic nucleus keeps on nagging on the bully, globus pallidus interna, uh, 
and encourages him to beat up the thalamus. When he beats up the thalamus, he can't push the motor cortex. So how do we get Mr. Putamen to move down this pathway versus this pathway? The answer to that is the substantia nigra pars compacta. So here we have substantia nigra. He's sad because he sees the teacher going the wrong way. So he sends out a signal called dopamine. And dopamine has two different effects. It stops this pathway and it encourages this pathway. So it's essentially like he's saying he's the tattletale. Substantia nigra pars compacta is the tattletale. We're going to call him the snitch. Substantia nigra pars compacta. He is the snitch. And to make this more clear, I'm going to draw the arrow. He acts directly on Putamen. So he is acting directly on Putamen, telling him which direction to go. So here we have Substantia Nigra with a speech bubble saying, this is what really happened, Mr. Putamen, and Mr. Putamen moves down this direction. He leaves Globus pallidus externa alone to keep the, substan uh, the subthalamic nucleus in check, and he goes ahead straight to the Globus pallidus interna and turns him off. So let's put this all together and look at both pathways. First of all, uh, motor cortex yells to Mr. Putamen and says, hey, I want to go. Mr. Putamen then goes over and stops the bully, Globus pallidus interna, from being mean. And now I want to remind you that Globus pallidus interna, it also includes the substantia nigra pars reticulata. So the bottom half of the substantia nigra. So the substantia nigra pars reticulata. And uh, so it, both of those are going to be bullies, but we focus on the globus pallidus because it's the main bully. And Mr. Putamen is going to act on both of those. Whenever he inhibits globus pallidus interna, globus pallidus interna can no longer inhibit the thalamus, and so the thalamus is free to excite the motor cortex. When that happens, motor cortex moves. On the other hand, we have motor cortex yelling to Mr. Putamen, and Mr. Putamen gets confused, and he goes off and inhibits globus pallidus externa. Globus pallidus externa would typically stop the subthalamic nucleus, which is the sounding board. It's the, it's the provoker, the instigator. Whenever he can't inhibit the subthalamic nucleus, subthalamic nucleus goes back and, and, and uh, is the antagonizer for the bully, globus pallidus interna. When the bully is being, uh, is being uh, hollered at by his buddy, he goes off and beats up Thalamus. Thalamus then is not able to go and excite this, uh, the motor cortex, and motor cortex is not able to initiate movement. But then we have our tattletale, substantia nigra, pars, com uh, pars compacta. Substantia nigra says, Mr. Putamen, that's not right. Instead, Mr. Putamen, this is the right way to go. So how this actually works is, uh, on the indirect pathway, dopamine is inhibitory by acting on D2 receptors. So there's a D2 receptor and it stops the indirect pathway. And then on the direct pathway it actually acts on a D1 receptor to activate the direct pathway. So in Parkinson's disease what actually happens is the substantia nigra stops producing the dopamine, dopamine and stops releasing the dopamine that it needs to release and so your brain moves towards the indirect pathway. So this would be the indirect and this is the direct. Now I showed this on two different sides of the brain but you have to realize that um, one side of your brain isn't following one pathway while the other is following the other pathway. You're either following the indirect pathway on both sides of the brain or you're following the direct pathway on both sides of the brain. So there's a couple other things I need to point out before moving on. First of all if you're looking at this and trying to look stuff up online uh, a lot of this stuff has different names, and so uh, one thing to note is that all of this stuff is called the basal ganglia. So the main structures within the basal ganglia are the caudate nucleus, the putamen, the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus, and the substantia nigra. Those are considered basal ganglia.
Another ganglia in the uh, basal ganglia would be the, the nucleus accumbens. So nucleus accumbens would be in there with it, and those are all the main structures of the basal ganglia. Now, another thing to keep in mind is because the caudate is connected to the putamen via cell bridges, these typically have the same structure, and together they are called the striatum. And then, whenever you consider the, uh, the putamen, globus pallidus externa, and globus pallidus interna, all of this together, whenever it's looked at from the side, it looks like a lens, and so it's, it uh, has been given the name lentiform nucleus. This name, lentiform nucleus, isn't commonly used on this uh, in a lot of books because these are different structures and they have different properties. And so um, giving them one common name really doesn't uh, help anything. And then another thing to be aware of, lastly, is that oftentimes the globus pallidus interna and globus pallidus externa are referred to uh, as one thing. So this is often referred to as the globus pallidus, even though one will act more in the indirect pathway than it does in the direct pathway. And so together with the globus pallidus, there's another structure called the ventral pallidus, and all three of these together are called just simply the pallidus. So if you have the globus pallidus interna, globus pallidus externa, and the ventral pallidus, all three of those are often referred to as the pallidus. Okay, I want to say one more thing about the disease and its pathology, pathophysiology, before I go on to clinical presentation and stuff. So we talked about how dopamine works. We, we called dopamine like the tattletale, and we said that he tells the uh, paladin, the putamen, I'm sorry, Mr. Putamen, uh, what's going on and what should really happen. However, there's um, a theory in, in Parkinson's disease called the dopamine, dopamine, acetylcholine balance hypothesis. So the balance of these two are what is really going on within the putamen and a, dis, uh, a dysfunction in this balance is what causes problems. So typically we have the uh, substantia nigra uh, pars compacta sending dopamine into the putamen and then we have possibly a number of ways for ACH to get in, uh, most particularly would be interneurons within the putamen. So uh, it's in there and both of them are acting simultaneously on the D1 and D2 receptors. Now when uh, the, so whenever you get the dopamine winning that fight, you have more dopamine and very little ACH, you get voluntary action. However, on the other hand, if you get very little dopamine and a lot of ACH, then you would have no movement because there, it's changing the favorability of which receptor and which pathway is being followed. Now the hypothesis is much more complex than that. Explaining it would take me a lot longer time that I don't have, but this is the basics of what you need to know for it right now clinically, is that the balance between dopamine and ACH are what control the voluntary movement. Now the reason that's important is because prior to uh, the uh, creation discovery of levodopa, or L-dopa as it's called, before that, things that were used to treat Parkinson's were acetylcholine inhibitors. So... Well, first it would help if I spell correctly. So, acetylcholine receptor antagonist. These were used initially uh, to treat Parkinsonism. And they're still used today as like a second or a third line treatment. Uh, the first line treatment would be uh, to increase the dopamine levels with levodopa. So the idea behind it, though, is if I have a balance between dopamine and acetylcholine, if there's this balance that I'm trying to maintain and my amount of dopamine gets dropped off so that I have very little dopamine and a lot of ACH, 
and the ACH is overpowering it, then I can cut off some of the ACH effect by blocking its receptors, and then the balancer is stored. Little dopamine, little ACH. So that's how Parkinson's used to be treated. Uh, so you have two abnormalities that kind of balance out. However, reducing ACH activity has other problems as well. So typically, the better side effect profile and better overall treatment is to try to get the dopamine levels back up to balance out with the ACH. So let's talk about the physical, the clinical manifestations of this disease. So one of the main manifestations is tremors, and it's very common to see a type of tremor called a pill, a pill rolling tremor. And it's called this because of, it looks like the person. Imagine that this is the arm and this is the thumb, and here's the hand and fingers. And the part, person's thumb and fingers will move back and forth across each other like they're moving a pill around. Parkinsonian tremors are typically tremors at rest, so they're resting tremors, and they happen whenever you're not making intentional movement. And so oftentimes whenever you go to initiate a purposeful movement, this will go away. Uh, it won't always, so it can have some uh, postural and intention tremors, but usually the ma they're, it'll be less severe than the resting tremors. These resting tremors will tend to uh, start off at least asymmetrically, and they may be hard to distinguish. And one way to, do, to bring it out clinically is if you ask the patient to rest his hand on his lap and to perform a mental, so you distract him from thinking about his hand, and you ask him to perform a mental calculation, and you watch the hand. So whenever he's distracted from it, it will become accentuated. Now the tremors don't have to be in the hand. Sometimes they're in the wrist, sometimes they're at the, at the uh, arm and shoulder, but it will typically start in the upper limb. So the tremors will start in the upper limb, and they can move to the lower limb um, later on as the disease progresses. The next thing is bradykinesia, and that comes from the inability to initiate voluntary movement. So because the motor cortex is not, is being, is not being pushed by the thalamus, they're unable to initiate voluntary movement. And what happens with that is you, even when they do move, the movement will be slow. When you're evaluating this, basically you're having the patient do different movements. And so you'll have them do finger tapping, hand gripping, pronate and supinate his arms, so different types of movements. And you just watch him carefully as, he, as you're doing the exam. During the progression of the disease, what you'll see is that the uh, patient will become, over time, less coordinated, and there will seem to be a hesitation in movement, where during the movement they may stop and then restart the movement in the middle. The next common symptom is uh, rigidity, and rigidity can present in two forms. It can present either as cogwheel rigidity or lead pipe rigidity. Now what cogwheel rigidity refers to is that the patient's arm, let's say if it was flexed up, it may be rigid, so as you're pulling on it to try to straighten it out, it'll have a ratcheting effect where it'll loosen up quickly and pop down here, and then you keep pulling it, and then eventually it'll loosen up quickly and pop down, and you'll get this ratcheting effect. That's known as cogwheel rigidity. Then, uh, so it's very common. The other type of possibility is that there's lead pipe rigidity, and just like it sounds like if you have a lead pipe sticking out of the ground, if you push it, it'll just keep slowly bending at the same exact rate without giving in and never speeding up or slowing down. The cogwheel rigidity is thought to be from rigidity superimposed on a tremor. So if you have a tremor and a rigidity at the same time, that's believed to be what causes the cogwheel rigidity. The next thing that's very common in Parkinson's disease at the initial onset is a postural instability and so initially it may be hard to detect but one thing you can do is you can uh, you can do a pull test and a pull test simply means what it sounds like you stand behind the patient and you just grab them by the shoulders and pull backwards a normal person should have normal balance reflexes and somebody whose uh, ability to move and follow a reflex pathway is inhibited
uh, will not be able to, and they may stumble backwards or pace backwards several steps. Your goal in this is to make sure that they don't fall. As the disease progresses, what you'll end up getting is typically a very wide-based gait, and that just helps them out with their balance. Their walking will become very shuffled in appearance, so it'll look like they have a shuffled gait. There's also going to be very small steps, or short steps, short steps, and something called festination. And festination basically is where you, your, the rate of your steps increases. So you're taking really short, fast steps. So it's like a little scurrying mouse. And the last thing you may notice with uh, their gait is that when they walk, they tend to not move their arms. Their arms are stuck to their side. And sometimes the arms are uh, flexed uh, like they're, as if they were holding something in their hands and they just won't move. Now, due to the inability to initiate movements, it becomes even hard to move the muscles of your face. And so one of the things you can get is something called hypomimia. Hypomimia. And this is also known as the Parkinson's mask. And the reason why is because it looks like you just, your face doesn't move hardly at all. It looks like you're, you're almost wearing a mask. It also becomes harder to speak, so your speech may become slow or, spur or, or uh, slurred. Then last, it, become, it can become difficulty to swallow, so dys, uh, dysphagia. And if it becomes difficult to swallow, difficult to initiate the swallowing process, then one thing you might get from that is a, something that is called sialuria, which is basically just drooling. Some visual problems that may occur is they'll get blurred vision. Uh, sometimes they won't be able to open their eyes. And then uh, when their eyes are open, they may get gaze problems where they have to look at one place or oftentimes they won't be able to look straight up. And this all makes sense if you think about the number of uh, muscles that are involved with looking up and down versus side to side. And the last of the symptoms we want to look at are musculoskeletal. Uh, some of the two, the two big ones that you would uh, pick out is something called micrographia. And that's where, uh, because it's so difficult to have movement, they start writing their letters really small. In which case, if I got this, I would be really screwed because I can't write neatly without making my letters about five times larger than normal. Then the other thing is they'll have a stooped posture. Then some common non-motor findings would be uh, they may present with confusion or cognitive dysfunction. There may be some dementia. Um, often, so this is just uh, sort of a subset. Uh, and a lot of times, Parkinson's, uh, the cognitive functions are spared. You may also see hallucinations or psychosis. It's like, oh, what am I looking at? Uh, this guy, he may have depression or she. I, I keep saying he. This could happen to a, a female as well. It's more common to happen to men. Um, but they could have uh, depression. And then sleep disturbances, where they're not able to sleep. Out of these, the sleep disturbances are usually reported as the most troublesome non-motor problems. And so sleep disturbances, you can have insomnia, where you have trouble going to sleep. You can also have sleep fragmentation, where you frequently wake up. And then you can also have like a, a, an REM uh, motor sleep. And this is called REM behavior, so RBD, REM behavior disorder or REM sleep behavior disorder. And this is where you have REM like uh, sleep all the time where you have motor activity during your sleep, moving around quite a bit. The diagnosis of Parkinson's is broken down into two parts. You have to have the inclusion and the exclusion. So inclusion, exclusion. So inclusion means what you have to have, you have to have bradykinesia, and at least one of these. And these would be muscle rigidity a tremor that is at least four, that is between four to six hertz or postural instability and the postural instability cannot be caused by a vision vestibular cerebellar or proprioceptive dysfunction.
So the things that we normally think of as postural problems that can't be caused by any of those has to be caused by the inability to initiate movement. So if you have bradykinesia in at least one of these, you've met the inclusion criteria. Now for exclusion criteria, so you want to be able to exclude stroke, head injury, drugs, especially dopamine, uh, the dopamine depleting or dopamine blocking drugs that are used for uh, psychotic, uh, antipsychotic drugs. You want to be able to exclude encephalitis. If there's a sustained remission, so somebody comes in today, has Parkinson's, they leave, they come back, the Parkinson's is gone and it stays gone for a long time, sustained remission means they never really had Parkinson's, it was something else. If they don't have a response to L-DOPA, Levodopa, then it's not Parkinson's. It's, uh, if it's still unilateral, so it'll start off unilateral, but if it's still unilateral after three years, you need to start doing another workup because it probably isn't Parkinson's. And then neurotoxins, you want to be able to rule that out and rule out a tumor. So what I'd do, like to do to wrap up is to show you uh, some other movement disorders that happen whenever you have damage to the various basal ganglia. And so we said that the basal ganglia includes the caudate, the putamen, the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus, and the substantia nigra. In Huntington's chorea, you have a, nucleot a trinucleotide repeat where you have on chromosome 4 the uh, CAG repeating over and over again. And, uh, and so this causes Huntington's. And what happens is it decreases the amount of ACH in the caudate nucleus. Eventually what you'll end up getting is glutamate excitotoxicity on the NMDR receptors and that'll cause neuronal cell death. It's going to be characterized clinically by sudden jerky purposeless movement and so the word chorea in Huntington's chorea, the word chorea means dancing. You can also get athetosis which is like a, a writhing movement of the hands. If you get a lacunar infarct of the subthalamic nucleus, that'll result in something called hemibolismus. Hemibolismus. And whereas Huntington's was kind of like a dancing move, hemibolismus is a sudden wild flailing of your arms, and you can also have the a leg on the same side of the body, and so that would be due to uh, a lacunar stroke.